Sergeant Brian Zwolak, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. So before we get into it, just let me just begin with the basics. Would South Carolinians be surprised by the number of gangs in the state? I think so. I mean, I think that we're getting there and our reporting's getting better, but I do think that even going out and talking to community meetings and stuff, people are genuinely surprised of the number of gangs and gang members that we have and the age range and stuff that we're seeing that. What are we talking about? So in South Carolina, the way we kind of look at it and, and the way we work that stuff as far as our documentation and reporting's concerned is we look at the structure of gangs. So you've got street gangs, you've got outlaw motorcycle gangs, um, criminal organizations, but as far as it's just, there's a definition, you know, you've got a group of individuals that are out committing crime that's consistent. Um, we go through that process. So you can have a gang that you'd see a gangland episode on the History Channel, and then you could also have a gang that's local that nobody's ever heard of uh, that's you know right here in Lexington County or, or one of these other jurisdictions that can be categorized as a gang. So this series obviously is about human trafficking. So let's talk about gangs and their impact on human trafficking. So first of all, what kind of gangs would be involved in human trafficking? What are you seeing in South Carolina? I don't think that it's necessarily a specific type of gang. I think that gangs realize how they can make money and the most efficient ways to make money. And um, human trafficking, especially when it comes to juveniles, that's when a lot of this, especially street gang wise, which is gonna be a big thing with human trafficking, that's when it starts is, is at younger ages. That's when recruitment, the main recruitment we see is with younger kids. So I think that really when it comes down to it once a gang realizes that 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 there's profit there you know especially when they're already recruiting some of these young kids that that they'll exploit that and, and use that criminal pattern to them just like selling drugs i'm trying to get my brain around what when you say a gang what are we talking about are we talking about it you know a group of 16 year olds who put the bandana on and wear the colors you know the stuff that we see on tv you know or is that completely a myth what are we talking about so i think gangs have done a pretty good job at adapting and understanding what people kind of see as gangs to kind of fly under the radar when it comes to law enforcement i do think when you're looking at some of the popular culture stuff and some of the the trends in music and stuff like that that we see gangs involved in you do see the bandanas and the hand gesture and people can look at the video and be like that it looks like gangs to me. Uh, when it comes to some of the stuff that you see on the street and the normal everyday actions of gangs, it might be a little harder to tell and harder to see. And it might not be something that somebody could just point out and be like, oh, that looks like gang activity to me. And uh, so I think it, it, I think it depends. In trying to educate parents and all about human trafficking, what, could a human trafficking gang be a group of men that look like a you know businessman or are we talking about what we would think of gangbangers you know i'm just trying to get that definition of what is a gang as as it relates to human trafficking i think that you could have either i think what we see more of is going to be more of the street younger um, a lot of the individuals that we've seen that are involved in that stuff were involved with narcotic sales and distribution in the past so i don't think that we can necessarily you know, say this is the description or this is exactly what it would look like. Um, but at the same point in time, I think that the recruiting aspect and starting that young, younger and younger and getting people indoctrinated into that lifestyle is becoming more and more important. I think where we're seeing a lot more of the human trafficking on our side, you know, it, it, for us, it's even new. You know, I, when I started working gangs, we worked prostitution ops and stuff and probably missed a lot uh, in terms of human trafficking. So even just like gangs is a newer thing for South Carolina and law enforcement, uh, not that it hasn't been here, I think it's kind of the same with human trafficking. So I think we're kind of learning as we go and focusing efforts a little bit differently, just like we do with gangs. And when you when you talk to experts like yourself about gangs, it's all about kind of that camaraderie and that feeling like they have a family. And it's the same thing about human trafficking. I mean, it starts with that vulnerability and that enticement. So is that what you're seeing kind of that the gangs use the same thing that lured them to to lure human traffic victims? Yeah, I think I think as a whole, you could probably say that I, I think that recruitment efforts across the board, I think gangs will recruit people and then kind of see what they can be utilized for. So, you know, gangs are getting younger and younger. Uh, I've seen that personally in my career. And you know, I think that 
gangs are utilizing, you know, some popular culture stuff with the music industry and certain genres there. But I do believe that gangs, when they are recruiting people, will get them there and find out what they can be utilized for. We notice a lot, you look back at patterns, and one thing that I've noticed a lot of is, you know, individuals involved with gang activities start out with, you know, incorrigible child reports, runaway reports, truancy issues, you know, those common issues with kids that maybe have some behavioral issues. And then they kind of go up the scale from there. So whether they get involved with narcotics distribution or trafficking or, you know, violent crimes, there's different there's different areas in a way that gangs utilize certain people for. So I think some of these runaways and stuff, especially when you're going with younger females, if they look at that and, and you know, we've done interviews where in these girls' eyes, they're members of the gang. It's like that's their, you know, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing for the gang. And I do believe it's the same thing that brought other members in that maybe due to other things is that they see possibility of, of I don't know, if fame or popularity. Uh, when it comes to the music industry, that music industry, that's a big thing that we're seeing is a lot of these kids getting involved in this lifestyle for that reason. And then once they get involved in that lifestyle, they also go to that fast money um, and human trafficking is involved in that. I mean, that's, that's right in line with that. And getting a lot of these kids that do the recruitment and bring people into the gang are, are intelligent kids. Uh, they have very good social skills. Uh, they're great at manipulation and they utilize that to bring to bring in victims whether it's human trafficking or or other members that get victimized in other ways they utilize those skills that they have to to suck them in and promise things and and before they know it these individuals are are being victimized and don't really know how to get out and then i think the gang is used that way as well in fear so once say somebody a victim of human trafficking understands that they're being victimized they're also scared to leave or say anything because that gang presence is there even if it's that one member doing it that idea that there's a gang and that they've seen the violence in a lot of instances and been threatened with it or, or just observed it that's there to you know make them nervous and, and kind of think twice before they talk to law enforcement or try to get out themselves and something that's uh, pretty just particularly devastating, I think, is the fact that females in gangs is growing, right? And females are are being used to entice other females. And that's got to be absolutely devastating because girls trust other girls, and girls wouldn't expect other girls to be luring them into this horrific life, right? Yeah, so I, I think that that's probably one of the most underreported um, aspects of gangs is the female involvement thinking that females maybe are just that part brought in to be victimized or abused, um, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's human trafficking or used to traffic drugs. We have female members that, you know, we've worked cases that have ordered the drive-by shooting that are over males. So you're right. I mean, you've got a female that is calling shots, say, and, you know, also recruiting other females. I do think that that probably absolutely plays a role into it is that, you know, well, she's, She's in it. Look at what she's doing. She's got male members and other female members looking up to her. So there is a trust thing there, you know, that that absolutely could draw female members in. And, and we see a lot of different things with gangs. Um, and it's not even just with gender, race and all that stuff. It, there is no particular path that we're seeing. It's all in the demographics of where you're working um, because gangs are continuing to go out from the cities. So. Um, really honing in on a certain demographic when we're working gangs has been you know something that we we definitely avoid because you miss things and you miss possible victims you miss recruitment and all that other stuff that's going on how much has um i guess the change in culture made gang life more attractive i mean you have you know people like cardi b and and just music that when you and i were young would be absolutely i mean it would be unheard of the lyrics yeah i think like i said i think recruitment wise i think that this that some of those changes in popular culture absolutely promotes gang activity in my opinion um, the idea that you can go out and make that fast money go out and do criminal acts and be part of an organized crime group and possibly make a living and you know become wealthy over then actually rapping 
or making music exploiting and talking about all the criminal things you've done. I mean, that's one of the main things we see when we, even locally, when we look at some of these gang members that put out these music videos and you listen to the lyrics, they're not making up what they're talking about. A lot of them have either witnessed it or done it themselves what they're talking about. And unfortunately, a lot of kids look at that and they say, I, I want that. I want to be in that music video. I want to be part of that stuff. And it's a recruitment tool. It's absolutely a recruitment tool. Look at these uh, young girls and stuff. They see these music videos and be like, I want to be in that music video. Like that looks like fun. That looks like what I want to do. I want to have fun. I want to be out there. And then before you know it, they start to be involved in stuff like that and slowly get sucked into that culture, into that lifestyle. And they're victimized before they know it. A lot of um, the advocates that we've spoken to said that, you know, many times, at least at the beginning, victims don't even realize they're victims. You know, they just get exploited and, and you know, they get involved in something, I guess going back to what you said, that seems glamorous. And it's just, they're doing these things that are horrific and they don't even, at the onset, it seems like it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And I, I would agree with that. I've talked to, I've, t I've interviewed people before and, and whether it's human trafficking or not, sometimes it's something like they, that's what they have to do to get ahead or that's part of it. And it's became normal. You know, the gang normalizes it. Like, this is what you have to do. This is, this is your job. This is what makes you valuable. And this is what makes you part of our family. So you go out there and you make that money. And also um, that push that to girls um, or males and something that that, that is your ticket. That's what makes you money. Um, and then the, you know, with some of these females, you'd go and you'd talk to some of these females and be like, you know, we'd exploit the fact that, listen, this guy is talking to six other girls. Like we, we know this, we've heard conversations, they admit to it. And it's like, well, yeah, I know, I know, I know that's what's going on. So something to, to us where we're interviewing, we'd be like, that's not going to be right. That's our end. You know, that's how we're going to show that hey, he doesn't really care about you is, is a known. It's not an unknown for that girl. They know it. And they're just like, yeah, that's, yeah, I get it. So in your experience, the one thing, it seems like you can't get get out once you're in. I mean, how in the world do you get out of a gang once you're in? I think that some of that is something that's been put out there. Like, you know, the only way to get out is, is you know, through death right. or through going to prison. Uh, and even then that you don't get out because you just get sucked into it in prison. I think some of it too is that person's, idea that you can't get out. So I think it depends for what you're talking about. I think if you're looking at a victim for like human trafficking, I would agree that it would be much more difficult because the resources aren't there. One of the main things that gangs are gonna try to do is drive a wedge between what you do care about. Even if you're a kid that's getting in trouble and you have issues at home, the first goal of that gang is to drive a wedge between any sort of normalcy when it comes to relationships or even hobbies that you have and, and remove them to make the gang the most important thing. So I think that that's part of it, is that people, it's not that they can't leave, but they don't know how to leave. They don't know how to go back to normal life because the gang is successfully in many ways, and even the trafficker that's, that's part of the gang removes all that normalcy that, you know, that we would see as like, you know, why don't you go home? Why don't you, we could, I haven't talked to my parents in years, or I haven't, all that stuff's gone. So to that victim or to that member, that the gang is what they have. That's all they have. And they don't know how to live without the gang. Um, we've done interviews before that you ask, like, why don't you just, why don't you just go home? Why don't you just walk away and go home? Well, I, don't, I can't go home. Or they try and they're just sucked right back because that's just so indoctrinated into them, that lifestyle, that culture that they'd miss it and they, and they go back. So. I don't necessarily think it's not possible to get out if you want to, but it's what the gang does to make it extremely difficult to get out. And do I think that there's instances where there's threats of violence? Absolutely. Um, are there times that it's carried out? Absolutely. Um, so I think that there are different, different situations, but I think that gangs do a really good job setting it up so it doesn't get to that point. So emotionally and mentally, they just, there is no out. You have to stay. Be, whether it be fear, you know, that lifestyle becoming normal, uh, there's different factors, but I do think it's absolutely 
you know, mentally and emotionally a feeling that they can't. There's nothing else to do. So, so where's the hope in that then? So if someone's watching this and, and is in that situation and wants out, what do you tell them? Go to, I mean, so when we've worked cases before is trying to develop that relationship through us and trying to get help, you know, through different resources, stuff like Lighthouse for Life. You know, th there are resources that we can help, but we need that person to want to help and reach out. I've worked a couple cases before where there's been charges that needed to be made that couldn't because we just couldn't, we couldn't get there. Uh, we couldn't, you know, the, whether it was the fear and the normalcy, whatever it was for the for that individual or those individuals, we just we weren't able to successfully get a wedge into there and and say, hey, listen, we're here to help you. We can help you. Um, so I think it depends, but I do think it's one of those things where it happens. People do get out and people do make lives for themselves. So I think that there is hope in that. It's just that person needs to say, I'm done, that's it, and then go and actually take law enforcement and take, you know, Lighthouse for Life and, and stuff like that and, and use it and, and try to get out and stick with it and not go back. So we see a lot of times is we'll make some headway, we think, and then before you know it, they're back out the same spot. We go to that hotel and we see them right back out there and we think in our minds like we made some progress and a week later it's right back. So I do think it takes some you know, personal choice that I'm done and I think that that's where a lot of that, diff that difficulty comes in. And I think where gangs are realizing how profitable human trafficking can be because you're, you're able to get your hooks into that person not selling a product. And plus it's probably, you know, someone once said to me that you know you don't have guns on you and the cops pull you over you don't have drugs on you it's just so much easier which is a terrible thing to sell a human being so, so less risky yep and 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 that's like i was just saying it's it's one of those things that's disgusting uh and the people that are okay doing it are disgusting but it is it's less risky because they can gain control over that person and make it so much more difficult for us to do our jobs because we need that person's cooperation. We can know, we can believe we know uh, what's going on, but without that person to cooperate with us and talk to us, it's very difficult to make some of those charges. Um, we've gone other ways and still put the person in prison, but it's not off some of the charges that should have been made because of that lack of cooperation. Can you talk to me, uh, in, in these conversations, we hear a lot about this concept of grooming. As a law enforcement officer, what does that concept mean to you? What does grooming mean? So I think a lot of stuff that we notice, and um, I'll tell you this, that we notice it not just with human trafficking, but just membership in general, is like I told you with kind of distancing that person away from hobbies, family. So take what's most important to that person, whatever it is, maybe it's only one relationship and driving that wedge in between that relationship or that hobby and making that next thing the most important thing because before you can get somebody to do something for you they have to a lot of times they have to feel like they want to do it for you so um me personally with some of the you know rituals that gangs use now to indoctrinate people you always heard about jump-ins you know they'd assault multiple members would assault somebody and you know then they would all of a sudden be in the gang. Well, now we see more of putting work in or hey, go out and break into these 10 cars and bring back this stuff. And then when they get done, maybe they give something back that they just stole to that person, kind of being like, oh, they care about me. Like I went out and did this stuff and I got something out of it. Uh, essentially, they're getting back stuff that they stole, you know, but um, and I think that goes the same thing with with a lot of your human trafficking stuff. We see when these guys um, get these girlfriends, it's all nice. They may buy them stuff, they ride them around, they show them off, and then before you know it, we start seeing some reports where maybe something happened or a family member called in because there was an assault or um, the female showed up with a black eye, and then it just, it keeps going. But by that point, I've interviewed girls before that maybe aren't getting traffic but are doing things for the gang, and they're, they just, it's normal now. They've been with them so long that even though they can see and you can tell in their eyes that they understand like this isn't right, what's happening to you is wrong, it's, they just stick with it and just kind of you know push their head to the side and, and keep on moving and stay right with that person. And I think that, that that grooming, whether you're talking about a human trafficking victim or whether you're talking about a member, I think oh, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, I know we talked to one girl that, that 
she was a member. She believed in her mind she was a member. And this person just made her a member. Said, Can, you're, you're a member now. You're a member of this gang now. Uh, didn't go through anything else. And that you could tell that that made her feel important. Mm. That she was impressed by it. And like, see, look, that, that's my family. I'm not talking anything about them. Um, and maybe she, she didn't really seem to know much about the organization or anything. But just the fact that that individual said, you're in. You're part of us now. She would, she would do anything for that gang. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. She didn't want to talk about it or anything. She was, you'd have thought she was a 10-year member. Um, and it was a couple weeks. One thing I know that really frustrates law enforcement officers is they wish that the public at large could know what they know, that they could view their safety through the prism that y'all see things through, you know, you're always alert, you're, you know that danger's around every corner. So what would you want the public to know about gangs? I think the most important thing is understanding that it's a community problem. We're not gonna rest our way out of a gang problem, um, that we need to work together. That to combat gangs, it's stuff that happens in the home, in the street, in the schools, and that it's nothing that you can arrest your way out of that we can just put everybody in jail that's gang members and it'd be fine. So I think that the biggest thing is for people to understand that it's going on and it's happening and to partnership with law enforcement to report stuff, to develop those reports. When, when people have community meetings and we send out this stuff, things like this, these programs, listen. And when you see stuff, act on it, say something. Don't just ignore it or think that the next person's gonna report it. But what are they looking for specifically? And this is my last question. What are they looking for? It's hard to say a specific thing. I have found that talking and going to community meetings and talking to community members, people know when something's off, right? Maybe not be able to explain it perfectly, but they look at something and say, that's not, that's not right. There's something going on there. When that happens, say something to somebody, call it in. Even if it's just a suspicious vehicle, a lot of stuff that we get comes off of those community tips. Um, talking uh, with your children about stuff and making sure that they understand that they can trust law enforcement and talk to law enforcement. Schools that have SROs. Um, those types of relationships, we can't do our job without positive relationships with communities. So we need to make sure that that continues. And there's no way we can fix issues when it comes to human trafficking, gangs, or any of that type of stuff without those partnerships. So when people see something and it just feels off to them, people don't need to feel ashamed to call it in. They need to call it in. We're out there. That's our job. That's what we get paid to do, to go look at that stuff and check it out and investigate it and see what's going on. That uncovers so much. And that phone call, because you see something and you think it's a little off, can help save one of these victims. So we need people to do that stuff. We need people to be eyes and ears and not feel afraid to call law enforcement and report stuff that they see that's suspicious. Sergeant, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it.